In this video, I'm going to create some special effects for when a player shoots an energy blast as a weapon. The first effect will be for when the blast is flying through the air, and the second one is when it hits an object. We'll be creating these effects by using the Niagara Particle System in Unreal Engine 5. I'll be building off the Flybot project I've created in previous videos. There's a link for these down below, as well as a link for all the project files on GitHub. I'll be explaining all the steps as I create these effects, but I highly recommend reading through the Niagara documentation on the Unreal Engine website. It does a great job describing how all the components work together. I also found the Niagara tutorials by Game Dev Outpost very useful while getting up to speed. They do a great job of showing simple examples of various features in Niagara. To get started with the effects, we'll open up the editor and create a new folder called Blast. Go into this folder, right click, and go to the Effects Asset List. In here, you'll see a number of asset types that are part of Niagara. Most of these types contain settings or functionality that can be shared between different effects. At the core of it all is a Niagara system. This is all you need to create a new effect. When we click on it, it brings up a window asking how we want to start with our system. We can create a new system using existing assets from a template provided by the engine, or we can copy an existing system we've already created. Since we want to create everything from scratch, we're going to create an empty system. I'll name it Blast Fly FX, which is what we'll use while the blast is flying through the world. When you double click on it, it opens up the Niagara System Editor. As you can see, there's a preview window, kind of like the material editor, so you can preview the system as you're building it. Right now we don't see anything, and this is because our system is empty. A system is a container that can hold any number of emitters. The emitters are actually what produce the effects that you see and hear. Before adding emitters, let's take a look at the system details. The node with the blue header in the System Overview panel represents our system. It consists of System Settings, as well as a System Spawn group and a System Update group. Each group can have any number of modules, which are executed in order from top to bottom. Modules in the System Spawn group are run once when an instance of the system is created in the world. Modules in the System Update group are run on every tick. We'll keep the default system settings, and we don't need to run any modules for our System Spawn group. But let's take a look at the System State module under the Update group. You can configure systems and emitters to use a looping behavior, such as spawning a new set of particles every few seconds. But we don't need to use that, so we'll change our loop behavior to once. Now to add our first emitter, let's right click in the System Overview and go to Add Emitter. You can choose from existing emitters you've made or that the engine provides. We'll create a new empty emitter. Just like the system, each emitter has settings at the top and a number of module groups. You'll also notice that the timeline has started moving. This is useful to help preview what the emitters are doing over time. The first thing we'll do is go to the top of the selection panel and rename our emitter BlastFly. Next, let's expand the emitter properties under the emitter settings. One thing we'll want to update is our sim target. You can run emitters on either the CPU or GPU. There's not really a right answer. It depends on what you're doing and what features you need. In general, you usually want to use the GPU over the CPU because there tends to be more processing power available. For this effect, we'll want to run it on the GPU. When we select this, we get a warning that we need to also enable fixed bounds. So we'll check that box as well. We'll use the defaults for the remaining emitter properties. We don't need to add any modules to run during the emitter spawn group, but we do want to change some things to run during the emitter update group. Under the emitter state module, We'll tell it to not use the system's life cycle and instead use its own life cycle. Like the system state, we only want it to run once, but we want it to run forever. So we set the loop behavior to once and the loop duration mode to infinite. Next, we'll add a new module to the emitter update group by clicking on this plus sign. We'll search for spawn, which brings up a few different modules for spawning particles, and we want spawn rate, which spawns particles continuously. If we set the spawn rate to 1, you can see particles start appearing in our preview window to the left. The particles that are spawning are white circles, which is defined in the sprite renderer at the bottom of our emitter. We'll take a closer look at this later. Next, let's take a look at the particle spawn group, which runs once every time a new particle is spawned by the emitter. It already has an initialized particle module, which sets some common properties for particles. If we change the lifetime to 0.5, or half a second, we can see our preview window spawns a new particle every second from our spawn rate, and then it dies a half second later. At the top of the preview window, you can see some particle counts info, and it's switching between 0 and 1 every half second as expected. Next, let's change our color mode to direct set, and choose a blue color. The sprite renderer uses this to color the sprites being drawn, so we'll see the particles turn blue in the preview panel. 
If you go to Window and Preview Scene Settings, it opens up a new window that allows you to choose the preview background image and colors. I'm going to disable the image and change the background to black to make it easier to see the particles. Back in Initialize Particle, we'll change the Sprite Size mode from Unset to Random Uniform. This will keep them round, but we'll have them spawn with sizes between 50 and 100. We can zoom in and out with the scroll wheel in the preview window to make the particles easier to see. Next, let's give the particle some movement by adding an Add Velocity module under the Particle Spawn group. We'll get a warning saying that we need to add another module, which takes care of calculating the position from the velocity we added. There are two modules that do this, and we'll choose the Solve Forces and Velocity module. This new module shows up under the Particle Update group. Let's go back to the Add Velocity module and set our X velocity to negative 1000. You'll see our particles now move to the right after they spawn. Let's now go back to our spawn rate module and change our spawn rate to 100. This looks more interesting with more particles. Let's go back to the initialize particle module and change the lifetime to 0.2. This makes our blast beam shorter. If we change it to 1 second, it makes the blast beam longer. For now, I'm going to settle on 0.4 seconds. Next, let's add a new module under particle spawn. We'll search for sphere and add sphere location. Up until now we've been spawning particles from a single point, but this will allow us to spawn particles from anywhere within a sphere. We'll choose a radius of 30, and we can see it gives the particles a lot more variation in their position. I'd like to have a larger concentration of particles where they spawn, and then have them fly off over time. Rather than having a constant velocity, we'll have it scale the velocity over the lifetime of the particle. To do this, let's add a new module under Particle Update, and search for Scale Velocity. When we add this module, it's placed at the end of the Particle Update group. We get a warning saying that it needs to come before Solve Forces and Velocity, so we can click and drag this module up in the emitter. By default this module uses a constant scale of 1, which doesn't change your velocity. We'll click the icon to the right of the velocity scale, and search for Lerp Vector. We want the velocity to scale from 0 when the particle is spawned, to 1 when the particle dies. These are the A and B scale points that are already set. For the alpha, we'll click the icon to the right and search for a parameter called Particles Normalized Age. This is a parameter that's already being computed by the emitter that we can use. In the preview window, we can see particles now stick around at the spawn point, and then fly off over time. The next thing I'd like to do is scale the size of each particle over its lifetime. To do this, we'll add a new module under Particle Update called Scale Sprite Size. Just like Scale Velocity, we'll also make this a LERP vector. We'll start at 1 for both x and y, so it's full size when it spawns. We'll then have it scale down to 0.1. To make this scale over time, we also need to set the alpha to the particle's normalized age, just like scale velocity. You can see the particles now get small as they fly off to the right. After playing around for a while, I liked how it looked with only scaling the y value. Now let's take a look at the render section. Emitters can render other things besides just sprites. For example, they can render meshes, or lights, or even audio. For our simple emitter, we're going to stick with just using a sprite though. Sprites are rendered using materials, the same materials that we use for wrapping meshes. By default it uses the sprite material that comes with the engine. If we click on it, we can see it's a fairly simple material that blends the particle color with a sphere mask. This is why our particles appear round with soft edges, and not square. One thing to note is that this material is using an additive blend mode. This means that the more particles stack on top of each other, the brighter it's going to get. This is why our blast appears white in the center. This material takes two parameters, a radius and a hardness. We'll experiment with different hardness values shortly. Back in the system editor, you can see there are quite a few values you can tweak for the sprite. We'll stick with using the defaults for these. If we scroll down, you'll see there are even more settings that are created using bindings. These use parameters that are created and updated in our emitter groups. For example, you can see our velocity and color parameters. Below these, you'll see we can also create material parameter bindings. Let's create one for the material hardness that we saw earlier. For the value, we need to use a parameter. We could use one of these existing parameters, but we're going to create our own with a custom value. Let's click on emitter spawn, and then set new or existing parameter directly. Let's then create a new float variable, and rename it sprite hardness. Let's set the value to 1, go back to our sprite renderer, and then change the hardness binding to use our new parameter. You'll see the sprite in our preview window looks a bit different now. A value of 1 is a bit too much, so let's go back to our hardness parameter and change it. If we use a value of 0.1, we can see it looks much softer. I like the value of 0.8, which gives it a bit more texture in the middle, but is still soft on the edges. 
I'd like the blast to appear thicker and a bit more dense, so let's go back to our spawn rate and change it to 200. I think this is looking pretty good now. There's one last setting I want to go back and enable in emitter properties. I want to enable local space, which changes how particles behave when the entire system is moving through the world. With local space off, the particles stay wherever they spawn in the world, even if the system keeps moving. With local space on, the particles move with the system. Since this blast effect will be moving through the world fairly fast, I'd like the particles to move with the system. We've now created our first system and emitter. We can now use this system by dragging it directly into the world, or by using it in actor components. I'll go into more detail of how to do this in the next video. For now, I'd like to create one more effect for when the blast hits something and explodes. Let's right click in the content browser, create a new empty system, and name it Blast Hit FX. Let's open it up in the Niagara System Editor, and use the same settings for the system state, emitter properties, and emitter state. One thing we'll do differently is instead of spawning particles continuously, we'll spawn all the particles at once when created. We'll do this using the Spawn Burst Instantaneous module. Let's set it to spawn 100 particles. In the Initialize Particle module, let's change the lifetime to 0.2 seconds, since we want it to be a fairly fast explosion. Since our particles spawn and die so quickly, you can see our preview window is empty most of the time. By default, the timeline at the bottom is set to play for 10 seconds, but our system only lasts for 0.2 seconds now. If we drag the right hand side of the timeline boundary down to 1 second, we'll see our particles spawn and die every second instead. This will make it easier to see changes as we update the emitter. In the Initialize Particle module, let's use the same color and sprite size as we did in the first emitter. Next, let's create an Add Velocity module, and also add a Solve Forces and Velocity module to fix the issue that it warns about. For the velocity value, let's set it to use a random vector, and set the vector scale to 1000. You can see the particles in the preview window are now starting to look like an explosion. Next, let's add a Scale Color module to our Particle Update group. We'll leave the color values as is, but for the alpha, let's change it to a lerp float. Let's start it at 1, end at 0, and then use the particle's normalized age parameter. This makes the particles fade out as they get further away from the spawn point. Let's also add a scale sprite size module like we did in the first emitter. This makes the particles also get smaller as they move further away from the spawn point. Last, let's set up a sprite hardness parameter and bind it to the sprite material parameter just like we did in the first emitter. This allows the particles to look similar between the two emitters. While I'm happy with how these effects look, these are fairly simple systems we've created. We've barely scratched the surface of what Niagara can do. There are many more modules to explore, and you can also create your own modules using HLSL or a node editor. You can also render much more complex systems with many more particles. For example, if we turn on the performance metrics and change the spawn rate to 1 million, it's still only taking half a millisecond for the particle update. If we switch this over to using the CPU instead of the GPU, you can see it takes quite a bit more time though. Our simple emitter could easily work on either one, but it's still good to prefer the GPU if you can. For more complex examples, I highly recommend checking out the Advanced Niagara Effects video on the Unreal Engine YouTube channel. It has some pretty cool examples of how particles can group together, but still avoid overlapping and avoid colliding into objects in the world. In the next video, I'll show how to use these effects that we've created inside of actor components as well as spawn them directly in the world. We'll use it with a projectile component when the pawn shoots its weapon. If you have any questions, be sure to ask in the comments down below. Thanks for watching.